Welcome to the third revision session presentation for superpowers, this time focusing down on EQ3. And the question for inquiry question three is what spheres of influence are contested by superpowers and what are the implications of this? So what spheres of influence are contested? Reminder, this does not replace your class learning that you've already completed. Please make sure you use this for revision and reminding purposes only. OK, so the first part of EQ3 focuses down on tensions between superpowers and conflict over resources. You, you already touched upon this a little bit in EQ2. This is where we, go in, we went into more depth. So you were able to identify and explain reasons for the potential and actual conflict so two sides there potential conflict that hasn't happened yet so possibly in the future and then actual conflict over resources and their exploitation so you, you'd have started by first of all having a look at the these images and each of these images has two products which are almost identical and we're asking you here to, to try and spot the fake if you like um, so here the image of the boots, the right one is the fake one. The one on the left is the actual product from the, the TNC. Um, looking at other ones, for example, the, the, the strings, the left is fake. So we here brought in this idea of counterfeit products, looking at the comparison of genuine products, which are often more expensive, and then counterfeit product, products, which are much cheaper. Again, we looked at some fake versus authentic products. Here's some, some hair straighteners here, the one on the left being the genuine, the one on the right being the fake, and then the Apple charger. So really here, we're looking at tensions between superpowers uh, and looking at these as not being unusual. Um, but some would argue the recent shift in shifts in patterns of power and the emergence of potential superpowers had led to a more unstable landscape, a geopolitical landscape. We then looked at the idea of this, of intellectual property rights, and we'll come on to that later on. And we then looked at emerging nations as providing a key market for what we call counterfeit goods. And one of the most prevalent ways to violate international property rights. And here was a good figure that we focused on quite a bit, an estimated 5 to 10 percent of world trade is actually in counterfeit goods. So then we focused down on, again, I know it was repetitive, of China and China being accused of being a leading violator of intellectual property rights, leading these tensions between nations because it is producing counterfeit goods. And then also looking at the tensions over territories, which leads into another lesson, looking at how it's trying to access physical resources, such as those found in the South and East China Seas. So here, what we're really looking at is contested geography. And this is a, a very complex, complex area where superpowers are fueled by resources. Again, we said that previously in EQ2. And the physical resources that superpowers and emerging powers actually need in, the ter in, in terms of fossil fuels, ores and minerals. And some of these resources are contested due to these reasons. There's three reasons here. Land border between two countries is in dispute. So this is where you'd have looked at India and Pakistan. And that links very nicely into the migration identity and sovereignty unit, where you look at that as a contested border area between India and Pakistan, looking in particular at the area called Kashmir. The ownership of a landmass can be in dispute. So, for example, Argentina's claim to the Falkland Island is still disputed. It's British territory, but it is disputed. Argentina say they own the Falkland Islands. And then also the extent of a nation's what we call EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, is in dispute or claimed by another nation. So these are three areas, border dispute, landmass dispute, or the EEZ dispute causes conflict between nations, often because there are resources there that they need. 
So we then define this EEZ in much more detail, which is the area of an ocean extended 200 nautical miles beyond the coastline over which a nation controls the sea and therefore anything within it or under it. So <clears throat> we then looked into China, looking at what is it is an international intellectual property right. And we first of all needed to define this clearly, whereas inter intellectual property rights ensures that transnational companies, individuals and also government agencies can protect their, their products, their inventions, their trademarks. Now, it's important because without intellectual an intellectual pro pro property right, Innovations and ideas can be stolen and used by others. So this is to prevent that from happening. But as we've previously stated, it is still happening. And here is an example. 22 fake Apple stores exist in China. Companies like this in China are replicating counterfeit Rolls Royce. Here is an example. Um, Range Rover. The top there is the UK designed Range Rover Evoque. At the bottom is a Chinese designed, what they call Landwind. So the, in, the importance of intellectual property rights has grown since the 1990s. And that's because, global, because of globalization here. So there's a good link back to the globalization unit. And also the rise of emerging nations, emerging countries, the BRICS, the mints, they're wanting to expand their manufacturing base. And this is where we have the problem with counterfeit goods. <clears throat> so we brought this into the idea, the, the model of, you, of spheres of influence. And here is a, a good map here, the US spheres of influence around the world. So basically the areas of the world that US can directly and indirectly control and the companies that it has. So you'd have then gone into the textbook again, looking at the flag book, pages 159 to 162, and made some detailed notes on tensions over intellectual property rights, alongside notes on how countries have contested these spheres of influence. That then brought us on to look at a case study of superpower tensions. And this is where we focused down on the East and South China Sea. Now, there was a, a series of lessons on this. Um, one of the lessons would have been based on these two, two YouTube clips where it really went into depth of why is there such tension and conflict over the, the East and South China Sea? And you'd have assessed the detail of this and the importance of the South China Sea and the reasons why these conflicts take place between China and other nations like Malaysia, the Philippines, and you looked at the USA involvement as well. So here is, the, I've left the, left, left the link to the spec here, this because this is really what you looked at in great depth, the political spheres of influence, the contested area of the South and East China Sea, resulting in, in conflicts with implications for people and the environments in this area. Now, this really is a, a summarised version of what went on there in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, with, where China is building islands, constructing islands in this area, claiming that area as its own, which is then in direct conflict with other areas in the South China Sea and East China Sea. If you remember, we looked at what we call the, the Chinese cabbage strategy and the nine dash line. The unit then moved on to look at this, superpower ties with developing nations. Now, again, this feels like we're repeating what we've done before in EQ2, where we looked at Chinese influence in some African nations. And here, you'd have been able to understand and explain the potential for these ties between Africa and China. And again, the potential implications of that. So China's investment, into the African continent here again, looking back to the EQ2 part of the unit, looking at the order to fuel its rapid economic development and China needed to secure a reliable supply of raw materials from these African nations. And if you remember, we looked at Angola in particular, supplying cheap oil to China. Um, China 
as we said at the time, is is now Africa's largest trade partner, buying about one third of its oil from the continent. We then looked at the on current rise of China and India and it's in and their increased geopolitical influence because India is doing things very similar to China and both are keen to reform global governance and institutions, part of the G20 and so on. But then look at how, however, China, the rise of China and India has also led to economic and political tensions. And again, referring back to the South and East China Seas. You'd have then looked at a bit of a picture analysis here, um, and this picture referring to the colonial era and reminding ourselves again, what is colonial? Referring to the direct control exerted over territories um, by many European powers between 1600s and 1900s. And then looking again and reminding ourselves again, a bit of repeat here, of the neo-colonialism, the indirect actions by which developed countries and emerging powers exercise or exert a degree of control over the development of either their former colonies or other poorer nations within parts of the world. So what you'd have looked at here is you're bringing these two together and looking at the neo-colonial control and the colonial control and how rising countries such as China are doing this. So really to bring this together, this is looking at superpowers and unfair relationships. So here, relationships are often based upon neo-colonialism nowadays, where superpowers are what we call pulling the political strings of developing countries, influencing, trying to control them, manipulating some of these poorer nations, introducing what we call unfair for terms of trade, cheap commodity exports for the developing world. So, for example, coffee, cocoa, oil, copper from, and copper in particular we looked at in Zambia. So, China, for example, getting those products cheap, but then set against expensive manufactured products from China into those nations. So, it's an unfair terms of trade. Then looking at the brain drain of skilled workers from developing countries to boost the development of world economies where the poorer nations of the world are losing poorer skilled people to countries such as China and India. And those poorer countries are losing that skilled labour. And Then there was this important question is whether the rise of emerging superpowers will make any difference to this relationship at all. So a nice summary map we would have discussed here, looking at Africa and its, its relationship. Does China and Africa, African developing countries, what is this relationship? And pause this here to remind yourself of the map, looking at the, the flow of, of people, of labour, of money into the European Union, into the United States and China and India, and really emphasising this brain drain. So we looked here at two things. On one side, neo-colonial um, view where China exploits Africa for its cheap raw materials, but Africa gets little in return. But then looked at uh, another view, a more developmental relationship where Africa actually is developing through this trade and development to the global economy. So what you'd have done there is you'd have gone to the textbook, um, page 164 of the flag book, and you'd have completed this relationship table, noting down evidence of this neo-colonial control where China's getting more out of it than Africa is. But also on the other side, looking at the more developmental relationship, we're actually African nations are benefiting from this as well. And then, again, one page, page 138 of the Lizard book, identifying both the benefits to both China and Africa. So then this led us on to growing tensions within Asia, where you'd have been able to understand and explain the cultural, political, economic and envir environmental tensions that exist. If you remember back to, to the lesson here, which is quite a complex thing to explain, um, looking at the economic center of gravity. Now, pause this here. Use this and go back to your notes on this, which we would have made in lessons. And 
here, what this, this model um, attempts to explain is the economic center of gravity is calculated by weighting locations by gross domestic product. And it tries to do this in a three dimensional level. And here you can see how the economic center of gravity has changed way back from the year 1000 right up to 1913, where it shifted predominantly west and northwards. <coughs> then looking at 1940 to 1950, following the Second World War, where the dominant US economy pulled it across the Atlantic Ocean. Then also the subsequent rise of the European Union, where it edged the economic centre back eastwards again. Uh, since the 1900s, China's ride has shifted it back eastwards towards Asia again. And then we brought in the more current and modern one belt and one road strategy of China, shifts it further towards India and China, and really is the economic centre of gravity returning back to its rightful position. <coughs> so we did quite a bit of detail on this. So then we looked at what could happen by the year 2030. Asia could be a very economically and also politically crowded continent because you've got lots of emerging powers in Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia. There could be a strong case for India and Indonesia to actually have a permanent UN Security Council seat. Doubtful, but it could be possible. But then looking at whilst China and India are vying for this superpower status, other Asian economies, as I've just said, are vying for regional superpower status. You then would have analysed this diagram here, which is looking at how India and China rank against each other and the world. Now, again, pause this here. And it's important to note what the rankings mean. Look at the bottom there. 2014 to 2015 rank out of 144 economies. And here you can obviously see China outranks India on, on the majority of these factors. The ones where it's closest is the market size pillar here. And, and also you could say the business sophistication pillar and the innovation pillar, where China and India really are competing. Then we delved into the China's One Belt, One, Stro one Road strategy, because it is vitally important here. So you'd have looked at what is the meaning behind this One Belt, One Road? Who benefits? Why has China developed this strategy? So return to your notes, because you did do an awful lot on this. And here is a brief summary. The aim is to form a cohesive economic area by building infrastructure, that's by road and by sea, increasing China's trade links with other nations by sea and by road, and also enhancing its cultural exchange. You'd have watched this documentary, looking at the One Belt, One Road strategy, what it is, how it works. So again, revisit that. And then you'd have referred back to the textbook, looking at page 139 of the Lizard book to identify the growing tensions between Asian nations, along with the growth of China and India, and added and supplement your notes from the documentary on China's One Belt, One Road strategy. And then this moves us on to the, the rather large area of superpower cha challenges, the general superpower challenges, where you'd have been able to understand and give reasons for the economic problems that superpowers face and the costs of maintaining their superpower status. So you'd have looked here at Europe's lost generation, how it feels to be young and struggling in the European Union. So here you'd have looked at the EU and the US uncertainties. So both of these regions are, are large areas, EU, many different nations, US, lots of different states, so slightly different setups. But both of these regions face challenges economically that may actually prevent them from maintaining their global importance and going forward. So the USA may lose its superpower status. The EU may not actually gain superpower status. But the USA is in a stronger position than the EU. 
And this is where we'd looked at um, the makeup of the USA compared to the EU, where the USA is made up of states which are not sovereign. And that links into the, the unit on migration, identity and sovereignty. Unlike the EU, which is as member countries, and it will be much easier to get the former to agree on policy. So the USA could actually be in a stronger position than the EU. The USA also doesn't have an aging population or it's not its aging population isn't grown as fast as the EU. The USA's fertility rate of 1.9 versus the EU's 1.6. So the USA's population is more youthful. Here, what you've done, you'd have looked at a numerous number of statements here regarding the EU and the USA. And what you'd have done at the time was read through each of these cards and decided if they belong to the USA or the EU. And you'd have colour coded them. You'd have colour coded each of these statements into either economic, looking at the economy, demographic, looking at the population, political, resource or social. And here you can see, pause it, remind yourselves of some of these statements between the comparison between the EU and the USA. You have then looked at the debt crisis. And if you remember as well, the lecture that Mr. Hatchell um, gave looking at the debt crisis and the global, global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, that this, this dealt a severe blow to the European Union and also the USA, but to a lesser extent. And the cost of bailout, the cost of collapsing banks and collapsing countries. And you'd have then again gone back to the textbook for more depth, um, looking to summarise the causes of the 2008 at 7 2008 financial crisis and the impacts it had and you'd have then looked at what we call the the following terms of subprime mortgage lending the assets austerity and interest which are all part of that financial crisis then eq3 moves on to look at how will this impact the future will it impact superpower status in the future or not so looking at uncertain superpower futures and where you'd have justified a potential scenario for changes in world power in economies during the next 20 to 30 years. <clears throat> We'd have had a discussion looking at the EU and Japan negotiating a trade deal. Is this going to be good for the EU? Is this going to be good for Japan? Could this mean that the EU becomes the next superpower? Could this mean that Japan becomes the next regional superpower? We then looked at a multipolar world, looking at is it possible to say what the world will look like in 2050 or even 2030 in terms of the positions of geopolitics? Um, there's a lot of uncertainties here. We don't know what's going to happen to certain countries' populations, their GDP, the impact of future wars. There, there may be future wars in certain areas of the world. We don't know what's going to happen for sure with global warming and the impact this will have on, on the USA, on China, and so on. And then, really, the best guesses are the best that can be done. This is why this is referred to the uncertain futures part of the unit. And if you look at this graph here, which is showing annual GDP in 2030, there's three project projections. It is unknown. It's uncertain. In which of these predictions does China have the largest GDP? Which prediction does the USA have the largest, largest growth? Which is Why is it hard to create GDP predictions for the future? There could be another financial crash, for example. Why are there three different projections we'd have discussed? And which factors could, factors could lead to these different projections? All of this leading to the uncertain future that we may have. So here you'd have looked at the projecting future GDP and you'd have looked at the Center for Economics and Business Research, the USDA predictions of the USA and the difference between the highest and lowest predictions of the Chinese economy. So there's four different scenarios here. We'd have discussed these in the lessons. So one scenario of a future world in the next 20 to 30 years is looking at what we call a unipolar world. Still, 
where the USA has superpower status, it has US hegemony across the world. That's one possible scenario. We could end up in what we call the regional mosaic, or what we commonly refer to as the multipolar world, where we've got numerous superpowers around the world, all completing part of globalization process regionally. Here are the other two. We could have an Asian century where, we, again, we have a unipolar world, but with China being the superpower with some regional powers surrounding China. We could then go back to the new Cold War era where we have another bipolar world where we have China and the USA in this case competing as the two global superpowers. So we'd have discussed at the time the potential for each of these four different scenarios. And here, looking at a table of data, you'd have you delved into this into more depth, looking at the actual GDP from 2005 to 2015, and then the projections, the predictions for 2021, 2020 to 2021 for nine of the world's largest economies. And what you'd have done here using that table of results, you'd have plotted a line graph to show the current and predicted GDP values for potential superpower nations. So that then completes inquiry question three um, of the superpowers unit. Now, again, here, this all links into inquiry question one inquiry question two it's all very synoptic and as you'll see this links back very closely to the globalization unit so folks that concludes the revision sessions for superpowers thank you very much